do it, but shit. Oh my god. So let's get let's get cruising along. We'll start back uh, where we left off. If you remember, we were talking about alcohol and drugs, uh, the very last thing, and then uh, turn that right on over to another section of part 91. Just kind of reviewing part one. I know that is general uh, abbreviations and uh, just general information. That's part one of the Title 14 Code of Federal Regulations. We have part 61 and part 91. Those two parts right there, they are commonly used by almost all pilots. So if I'm going through all the different type of operations I could have, cor corporate pilots, they're flying under part 91 and, and that's about it, primarily under part 91. Uh, charter pilots like myself are working under part 135. Airline pilots are working under part 121. So as a whole, we're all working on, under different sets of rules and whatever rules apply to me in my current operation, whatever I'm flying that leg that day, uh, I have to make sure I'm in compliance with all those rules. But the two big ones, just to get started, 61 and 91. Yesterday, I gave you guys kind of a little memory aid. Does anybody remember that? Okay, 61 is how I get the license, okay, or the certificate. 91 is how you lose it, okay? So that's just a quick memory aid on, all right, 61 describes, these are the rules by which I become certified. New certification, a new rating, something changes, I get new uh, abilities, new capabilities as a pilot, privileges and limitations. Part 91, these are all my general operating rules, okay? So on part 91, we're gonna go from 103 to 151 today and hit the high spots, hit the ones that, these are, Common rules that you should know. Now, the book is thick. The, the, F, the uh, Federal Aviation Regulation book is pretty thick. And these are uh, rules that pilots should know if they're gonna fly anything, anything at all. Well, remember, we gotta have some sort of reality layer in here too. The reality is no one is gonna read that entire book, much less know it, before you come and start flying airplanes. So that's why we're just kind of picking through and knowing the, the real hot topics, okay? But I encourage you to continue to read that as much as you can. Okay, pre-flight action. Uh, what kind of information do I need before I can fly an airplane, especially if I'm gonna fly it away from another air, airport, okay? So if I'm flying and I'm just staying in the traffic pattern, yeah, we probably uh, need just a little less uh, pilot information or a little less pre-flight information. Why? Because I'm going to take off from the same runway I land at. I can see what's happening with the weather. I don't even need to have a weather station available to me for this flight. Okay. So if I'm just taking off and landing, sure. Agreed. Then I'm not a whole lot, but the rule still applies. Now, if we're flying away from that airport and going somewhere else, what all information do I need? <laughs> the rule, the rule is written kind of funny. And the rule uses a word that I try my best not to use. That word is all, everything, always everything, okay? All available information. You are 100% responsible for every piece of information before you take off. Now they gave us a laundry list of things that I need to know. Runway lengths, aircraft performance, I have to have sufficient fuel. Yeah, there's certain things that they'll list out for me. But by saying all and saying everything that's available, you are responsible for. That means if one little thing happens and you didn't catch it as part of your pre-flight brief, you could be in that group of part 91, this is how you lose it, okay? So spend some time before flying the airplane. Uh, in the beginning, you could have probably driven or rode a bicycle to where you're going by the time you get done planning for that flight, but it gets a little easier after a while. All right, so each pilot in command shall, before, becoming, before beginning a flight, become familiar with all, that's a big word, all available information concerning that flight. All right, you are required here, again, by 
as pilot command before beginning any flight become familiar with all available information, including runway links at airports of intended use, takeoff and landing information. You can see here we have my ugly green book. It was in here somewhere. I think they changed rooms and these pieces probably got them all in there now. We don't need it now. Tomorrow, we're gonna start working with air, airplane performance. That is your, well, this is for a diamond. That's for this particular airplane, their POH or AFM. It's important that I look through and find out the information for where I plan to operate and also how my airplane is gonna behave along the way. Okay, something else, and this is just added in as some of the digital tools that are available for me. I don't have to make it hard. This really does not need to be hard. Uh, if I wanna always go to the ugly green book, that's fine. Not a lot of pilots do that, some pilots do. There are other ways to do it. The internet is a nice, useful tool. For flight is a nice, useful tool. As long as I have the up-to-date information, these things work. But I could also use an updated database in the airplane. That's on the MFD on the G1000. I can click over and find out, look at all this stuff. Runways, links, widths, uh, how high it is with the field elevation, all of the frequencies. This information is available in every airplane that we have uh, at the field. So you just click through on the Garmin 430, a little bit different display, smaller display, but you can see all that information. Okay, each pilot command shall, before beginning a flight, become familiar with all information, that's fine. That must include, for a flight not in the vicinity of an airport, weather reports and forecasts. Fuel requirements, alternatives, alternate courses of action. So if I think there may be a storm system running through or a, a low level uh, uh, fog, some sort of any kind of hazard that may roll through and prevent me from landing at my destination, let's go ahead and plan for where that alternate is, okay? Because we have to fly there once we can't land at the other place. Uh, if the planned flight cannot be completed in any known traffic de delays in which the pilot command has been advised by ATC. It's not uncommon for us to go out, start the engine, taxi through the non-movement area, all that ramp, request taxi, get on the taxiways, taxi all the way out to the run-up area, and sit there. There's just a line of traffic waiting to leave. Okay, it's a busy place. So I may be on the ground for, gosh, 30, 35, 40 minutes. It doesn't commonly happen. It's usually, if anything, five, maybe 10 minutes I'm waiting. But I could be on the ground for a long, long time. How much fuel am I consuming? Not much. But I have to plan for that. I have to plan for how much fuel I'm gonna consume on the ground. The airplanes carry between 40 and 50 gallons of fuel, depending on which one you have exactly that you're using from, from, our, from our airplanes. So that is more than enough fuel. That's five hours of fuel, four and a half, five, almost five and a half hours of fuel. But remember, the certification is only step one. As soon as you begin to fly airplanes on your own, you'll probably start adding people or cargo in the back, even in a 172. So if I wanna go and I wanna carry three people with me, I'm not gonna carry full fuel because I'll be out of balance. I will exceed the weight limitations on this airplane. So that 45 minutes sitting on the ground could limit my range, okay? All right, so I just gotta have any kind of known ATC delays. These things are happening. I can call ATC before I take off. If I'm short on fuel and I know that I have only just enough fuel to get to where I'm going, plus my minimum reserves, I, I probably wanna call clearance and ground before I start and say, hey, what's it look like out there? Or, Am I able to get out and go? I, I, I am only carrying minimum fuel on board, so I'm not gonna start this engine before we before we know that I can get out there and leave. And uh, while you are waiting, are you able to turn off the engine? You can. The problem is if I turn off the engine, I have no way to charge the battery. And if I don't have the radios on, I don't have any way to listen to ATC. Um, so this entire- Consume uh, much uh, energy? It will. 
Be because you know, I like the questions, you know, the questions are, well, I could leave my battery on in my car probably and listen to the radio for a long time. The battery in the airplane is only about this big. It's got 24 volts, but it does not have a whole lot of endurance. So if I have my avionics master on, I don't have any other light or nothing else on, but I have the radios on, I got about 15, maybe 20 minutes, and then you're not gonna be able to start. And that's if the battery is 100% before you, you try to do this. So it, it doesn't take long, those batteries will die. But yeah, I get, I get it. I get, you know, hey, why don't I just turn the radio on, listen to it, listen to ATC and monitor them and just shut the engine off and save some fuel. Can't do it. Handheld radio is an option. There's a lot of different options. Like I say, it, it, that's absolutely 100% your plan. So by all means, just make sure you have a plan with it. Here it doesn't tell us exactly what to do, but it tells us to make a plan. I like what you guys are doing, that's good. So here's another thing. Take a look at what we got available for us. Inside an airplane with ADS-B N capability, we have some. You can get up-to-date weather information. You can also get no TAMs and ATC delays <coughs> right there over the FIS-B system, the Flight Information System broadcast. So again, it doesn't have to be hard. Nothing, no one implies that we can't use all of these uh, latest and greatest gizmos to help us streamline and help us work this out, okay? You don't have to call them all the time on the radio. This stuff's gonna take a little bit of power. I probably can't keep my engine on during that, but if I'm not concerned about it, I'm just looking at weather, I can have it right there. Okay, flight crew members at the stations. <laughs> That's fun. It's fun because if anybody from the front seat of this airplane tries to go anywhere except for that seat, it's going to look fun, okay? It's gonna look like a lot of, uh, a lot of commotion. I've seen it before. Uh, I've personally, when I was much smaller, uh, moved from one seat in the 172 to the back seat. And uh, you're not going to do that too often. But you'll do it on other airplanes, so we'll talk about it here. During takeoff, landing, and while en route, during those three phases, everybody in the airplane has to have a safety belt on. Okay? Each required flight member shall, well, it, during taxi takeoff and landing, you have to have the, everybody in the airplane has to have it on. Here it says each crew member shall keep the safety belt fastened while at the crew member station. Uh, we just talked about, you're in a Cessna 172, you're not going anywhere but that station, okay? During takeoff and landing, each crew member of a U.S. registered aircraft cup shall keep his or her shoulder harness fastened while at his or her assigned duty station. It does not apply if two things. If it doesn't have a shoulder harness, some airplanes don't, or if the use of this shoulder har harness prohibits your duty, your performance of your duty, okay? In the King Air, I've got a relatively wide cockpit, and I'm able to fly that thing single pilot. I have a first officer next to me, but we don't necessarily need that person there. I can fly this thing by myself. With my shoulder harnesses on, I cannot reach the alternate static uh, 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 selector for my static source. I can't reach the ELT. I can't reach certain circuit breakers. So at that point in time, I can come out of that shoulder harness and then reach over and perform my duty, but then I gotta put my shoulder harness back on. All right, so pilots, while at your duty station, you gotta have these, these seat belts on the entire time. Shoulder harness, if it's installed and it doesn't prohibit your, uh, if it doesn't <coughs> make it so you can't perform your duties. Okay. Unless the pilot command of that aircraft ensures that each person on board is briefed how to use a seat belt, then you can't take off. So I got a passenger. It doesn't matter if they've heard it before. It doesn't matter if this person is related to you or anything else. This rule says that before each flight, I have to brief that person, okay? <clears throat> I've seen some pilots do some pretty fancy briefings. I would think I was on JetBlue flight by the time they get done, we're sitting in a 172 just soaking with sweat because it's that hot outside. 
I'm like, come on, okay, yeah, safety belt, okay, yeah, as you keep going, emergency exits, geez, oh, Pete's, what are you, beverages, are you kidding, what are we talking about here, you know? And they keep going on. Remember, the safety brief is simple, it doesn't have to be difficult. No smoking flight, seat belts on during taxi takeoff and landing, there are your exits, you got any questions? That's it, right? I just brief somebody. You're supposed to brief them how to put this seat belt in, so show them how to put it on as they're doing it, show them how to take it off, all right? Uh, no pilot may cause to be moved or taxi, take off or land, unless the pilot in command of that aircraft ensures each person on board notified his or her safety belt, and if installed, his or her shoulder harness. So I also gotta tell them to put that thing on, you know? Can't land the airplane and expect somebody to not put their seat belt on, I gotta tell them. All right, <coughs> operating near other airplanes. We can fly in formation. I think a couple years ago, quite some, and they may still be on there. Andre and I were doing quite a bit of uh, formation flying in different airplanes. I think you had a helicopter one time, I was flying the Cirrus. So has anybody, if you've, if you've seen that, that's great. That's uh, fun, fantastic. But if anybody thinks you wanna fly formation flight, you can, nothing wrong with that. But both pilots have to be informed. You can't slide up on your buddy while they're in the practice area because you saw them out there practicing slow flight and then all of a sudden, hey, guess what? I'm right next to you. It, it, it doesn't work that way, okay? So no person may operate aircraft formation flight except prior arrangement, prior arrangement, but each pilot in command. And if you're formation flight, no passengers if you're carrying them for hire. So no revenue flights on this. It's a part 91 flight, no passengers for hire. Both pilots have agreed to it. We can fly formation. Okay. You guys tell me about the airplane speeds. I'm gonna, ba I'm gonna back it up. I'm not even gonna put the slide up there because we've talked a lot about aircraft speeds. So talk to me. Give me one airplane. Somebody give me some, uh, one of the airplane speeds, maximum airplane speeds. How much is it? I hear 200 knots. Where's that at? All civil airplanes. So if it doesn't have... Okay, <laughs> yes, it does apply to that airplane as well. Yeah. So all civil airplanes, no. what are the speed limits? I feel like I'm glad I asked that question because I'm, I'm hearing some things that don't sound fantastic. Below this is a big one. What is it? Uh, below subsonic uh, is. All right, you guys are missing a, a, a a big a big part of this not necessarily below subsonic okay any just start with one and give me one all civil airplanes aircraft have speed limits in the United States no matter what and there's a couple of different areas what's that 200 you said something you're right there but you're not telling me the rest of the information 250 where say again Okay, now we're piecing it together. If I'm below 10,000 feet MSL, this is, <laughs> I've taught this class enough to know, and I know that most pilots, when I start talking speed limits, they, they look over here and they see this thing and they go, Click. I'm not listening to that speed limit stuff because it doesn't apply to me. It does, okay? <laughs> All right, so below 10,250 knots. Are we gonna go 250 in this thing? No. But it affects me because there's other airplanes out there as well. And I know if I'm below 10,000, I probably will be, then I will not encounter another airplane in excess of 250 knots unless it's a government airplane. I have no, there's no rules for them. They don't comply with this rule. But there's no civil airplane that's gonna be in, in excess of 250 knots below 10,000. That's important for me as a crew member because trust me, there are a lot of airplanes around you that can go way over 250, all right? So not just necessarily what I have to do, but what is going on with other airplanes around me. Okay, another speed limit. I'm really glad I talked about that. You're telling me 200, but where? 
Okay, in the vicinity of an airport. Anybody know the specifics on that one? That's correct. 2,500 feet and below, four nautical mile radius, class Charlie and Delta airports. All right? I, I, I know. I know that the student pilot group just turns the brain off as soon as I talk airplane speeds. They're like, yeah, right, that crappy thing goes 120 maybe. I get it. No airplane is going to be out there around you within four nautical miles of class Charlie and Delta below 2,500 feet traveling faster than 200 knots. Okay. There's another one. 200 knots below class Bravo. Okay. Inside class Bravo, what's my speed limit? 250. Okay. It's below 10,000 feet, 250. Plus I need a clearance to get in there. Below class Bravo, here you have a, a metropolitan area, so busy traffic, a lot of VFR traffic because they're not climbing into the class Bravo, they're staying out of it. A lot of pilots not talking to anyone. The FAA said, hey, let's do this. Let's just slow everybody down below class Bravo, 200 is the max. And do you guys remember a VFR corridor that goes through class Bravo? All right, LA has one of them. I think there's a couple more. I don't really spend a lot of time talking about VFR corridors, but there is a block of airspace that goes all the way through class Bravo and it exists as class Echo airspace. So it's just cut out. The Bravo airspace pilots are not authorized to enter it. The Echo airspace pilots are not authorized to go into class Bravo. The speed limit through there, again, a congested area, could be a lot of traffic in opposite directions, 200 knots. All right, so there's your airplane speeds. Unless otherwise authorized, no person may operate airplane below 10,000 feet, indicated airspeed of 250 knots. Uh, unless otherwise authorized by ATC, they can't operate at or below 2,500 2, feet above the surface within four nautical miles of the primary airport class Charlie or Delta airspace, indicated speed of more than 200 knots, okay? You can't operate an aircraft in airspace underlying Class Bravo, an area of an airport in a VFR corridor designed through such a Class Bravo and an indicated airspeed of more than 200 knots. When Jepson decides to put Miami up there. Now take a look. All around here, you've got airport, 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 pilots flying all around that. If a VFR pilot came through with a Learjet or a Citation or a Beach Jet or a Gulf Stream or whatever, could happen. If they went through there cruising through at 300, 350 knots, you probably might not be able to see and avoid that airplane, okay? The closure rate, by the time you see it, recognize what it is, it's too late. So everyone has to slow down there. Okay. Compliance with ATC clearances and instructions. <coughs> ATC tells me to do something. Do I have to do it? What if I'm not in class Charlie airspace? What if I'm not in class Bravo airspace? What if I'm in class Echo airspace? What kind of airspace is class Echo airspace? I got a bunch of different answers. What was it? Controlled, that's the right answer. Well, there's only one kind of airspace that's uncontrolled. What's that? Golf. Class golf. Okay, that's the only one. Okay, so I'm in class echo airspace. Where is this? Everywhere, E for everywhere, for everybody. I'm not in class Bravo, Charlie, Delta airspace. I'm not, I'm not close to an airport. I'm flying out in the middle of nowhere at 8,500 feet. Life is great. I'm doing my thing, but I'm talking to ATC for whatever reason. I may talk to them, I may not. It's an option of mine at that point, if I'm VFR. If they issue instructions to me, I'm in class echo airspace. Do I have to do anything? Do I have to comply with their instructions? 100%, okay? ATC instructions are exactly that. And, and that's a, that is a binding agreement, meaning that once they issue the instructions, if it does not 
create an unsafe condition or if my airplane and I'm not in an emergency, I have to abide by those instructions. If I don't want to, I can request for an amended instruction. I can say, I don't like that. I really don't even need to give them a reason why. You probably want to tell them what you would like to do instead. So give them an option. Don't let them guess. Don't play a guessing game with them. You know, that doesn't work for me. Could I do this heading or this altitude instead? And they can approve it. But if they disapprove, guess what? I, I got to abide by that. If it becomes a safety hazard, now I can deviate. If I'm in an emergency, now I can deviate. Okay? So ATC clearance has been obtained. I'll give you a good example of ATC clearance because people think, think into this a little bit too much. They might tell me, is Skyhawk 7 Bravo Alpha operate VFR at and below 3,000 feet? Okay? What does that mean? Visual flight rules. So pertaining to whatever altitude I'm, or whatever airspace I'm in, 500 below, 1,000 above a cloud, 2,000 horizontal separation from a cloud, three statute mile visibility at all times, and I have to remain at and below 3,000 feet. I could go down as far as I want to within legal compliance. I could go up as long as I don't go above 3,000 feet. If you begin a climb and you go above 3,000 feet, now you violated that clearance. So ATC clearances, those are just instructions that you hear from ATC, and they're, they're, they're very, very specific in what they tell you what to do, okay? So I, I cannot deviate from the ATC clearance unless an amended clearance has been attained, an emergency exists, or the deviation is a response for a traffic alert, collision avoidance system, or that resolution advisory. So some sort of safety. You know, they tell me to turn or maintain an altitude, and I look out there, and oh my gosh, look, there's another airplane there. Or I got computer systems on board that are telling me there's another airplane, I'm about to crash into it. TCAS. Certainly so, yeah, TCAS, for instance. I could deviate then. Okay. <clears throat> if you have that emergency or in response to some sort of TCAS, and I deviate from ATC clearance or instruction, I shall notify the ATC of that deviation as soon as possible. So I'm traveling along. They told me at or below 3,000 feet VFR. All right, I, I have an emergency and it requires me to do something other than what they said. I got to tell them pretty quickly. I can't, I can't play the guessing game with them there either. You know, I'm deviating from this instruction. Get back on the radio. Tell them, hey, I, I'm coming away from this. Here's the reason why. And then if you're given priority by ATC, you shall submit a detailed report of that emergency within 48 hours of the manager of the ATC facility. It doesn't go to the administrator. It doesn't go to Oklahoma City, Washington, D.C., the FISDO, none of that, to the ATC facility. Tell them within 48 hours, and they'll tell you, you were given priority. You owe us a report. You got to fill out that detailed report. What do you do before you fill out that detailed report? Call a lawyer. Right? Or AOPA or somebody. Get some help writing that report. Okay. Any questions on ATC clearances? All right. Vicinity of an airport in class Echo airspace. Non-towered rules. All right. Each pilot of an aircraft must comply with any traffic patterns for that airport in part 93. If you haven't looked yet into the advisory circular 90-66 Bravo, part 93 is spelled out exactly word for word in great detail in plain, clear English. There's, there's very, I haven't found any room for interpretation on that. That is a very clear cut guidance. So read that and know if I come into an airport, I need to know if it's left traffic or right traffic. I have to know these. I have to know how to join that traffic pattern. I can't just come in here and, oh, well, you know what? There's a runway there. It doesn't look like there's anybody landing. I'm talking on the radio. I'm just going to go straight in and land. You can't do that. You just cannot. You got to comply with the traffic patterns, okay? 
All right, fuel requirements. What were the fuel requirements? VFR during the daytime, what do we have? Half an hour, okay? Half an hour after I get to my destination, plus an alternate if I'm filing an alternate, and then that extra half hour of fuel at cruising speed, okay? What about nighttime? 45 minutes. So whatever trip you're planning, I gotta get all the way to the destination. If, if in my judgment I require an alternate because I get there and I'm not sure, I got five statute miles of visibility reported at this airport, yeah, I need to go there plus to my alternate plus another 45 minutes. I'm gonna calculate that fuel and that's my minimum fuel. And by the way, at that point in time, remember that crash we were talking about that came from, was it, I think it was a Colombian flight. Is it a Colombian or a Bolivian flight that went up to JFK? <coughs> and they, it was a foreign flight crew. Uh, they weren't speaking English very clearly. They were a very Spanish flight crew. They came over, uh, very terrible weather. They had uh, uh, the entire northeastern seaboard was trying to deal with a, a, an influx of traffic, which they always do, but bad weather, so they had people holding. And they put these pilots in a hold and they were holding. And they put them in another hold and they were still holding. Truth be known, they did not have, they were working into their fuel reserves at that point. Then they tried to make an approach, didn't make the approach, applied power to take off because they, they didn't make uh, the required uh, visual contact with the runway. They had to go around, go missed. They went around and the climb out came back. Then they finally told them, hey, I got an emergency here. And coming back into final, ran out of fuel, crashed. I think, I'm pretty sure everybody died in that one as well. There's usually not many survivors in these things, okay? What they had was minimum fuel. So if I have enough fuel to go from where I'm starting to my destination and then to my alternate and only 45 more minutes, guess what you have? You have minimum fuel. So if you're talking to ATC anywhere along the way, if it's a control tower that you're landing at, well, you will talk to ATC. If you're talking to ATC anywhere along your way and ATC attempts to deviate you from your straight line track, you say the words minimum fuel and they will not, they will issue you an amended clearance and you'll go right back on the track where you were before, okay? I've had to say it before, and ferrying airplanes is sometimes over water and so forth. When I get there, there's just not any more than my reserve left in the tank. I'm landing this thing, it's got 45 minutes worth of fuel, you know, 50 minutes worth of fuel, but I'm not accepting deviations that are gonna cause me to eat into that, that reserve, okay? All right, <clears throat> so during the day, 30 minutes at nighttime, 45. Yes. What the heck is my VFR? Uh, I don't understand your question. I mean, you can see it, right? You can see. Uh, yeah. You can see much, okay. All right. So, so this. Yeah, so yeah, I, I like the question. Um, is there VFR at night in, in Russia? No. There is? Okay. I, I, the reason I asked is because I usually get that question from my Spanish group. Because my Spanish group, they're like, what do you mean VFR during the night? There's no such thing. It, what do they have in all of South America? A bunch of mountains. So all across South America, well, except for Venezuela, I don't know what they're doing there. But all across South America, they are not, pilots are not authorized to fly at nighttime VFR. You're, you're just, you're not, you don't have the privileges to do that. So you're right, I can't see much, but if I'm not operating over water, if I'm not operating over very, very sparsely populated areas, 
even in the darkest night with not a sliver of moon in the, in the skyline, I can still see pretty good because I'll have lights out there and especially city lights. And when you do your night flights in Fort Lauderdale or in Broward County, you'll see there are, it, it's almost worse because now you got a bunch of lights and you're like, where in the world is the airport? I, I don't know how to find this dumb thing. Okay. <clears throat> but you're right. I can see pretty good. And we're authorized to fly visual flight rules at night. Something that I might not be able to see is a cloud. So if I'm operating at nighttime and I've had this happen to me a time or two, uh, if I'm operating at nighttime and all of a sudden I see the reflections off the strobe lights, that's just shining off the, the cloud that I'm in. And if I'm not on a, a, an IFR flight plan, I need to apply some sort of an escape maneuver. Okay. But we can fly VFR now. Yeah. Just turn around 180 degrees. Don't drop the airplane. I turn around 180 degrees and get out of there. Now, one other thing, we'll talk about it. No, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Is uh, some optical illusions. You, got, you have to be a little bit careful when you use your instruments a little bit, especially at night. Because if I see a long line of lights in front of me, that might look a lot like a horizon. And, and I could line myself up so that I got this thing straight in front of me as a horizon when actually it could be a road in front of me. That's a false horizon and it leads me into a, a different type of tragedy. Okay.